Ahoy, mates. You know, we call this island Key West, but in fact, it is not. As you can see, there are a number of islands to the west of Key West. And we have to travel some 70 miles out to sea to reach what is truly the Key's westernmost extremity, a cluster of coral reefs we call the Dry Tortugas. Like the rest of the Keys, it's a tropical paradise, but it is also our nation's most inaccessible national park, designated as such not only to ensure a sanctuary for sea life and sea birds, but also to provide for the preservation of one of the architectural wonders of the world, the biggest brick building in the Western Hemisphere. Over a century ago, here on Garden Key, man built a colossal fortress that rises from the sea. Of course, it's something that few people get to see. That's why this week on the Nautical News, it's Destination Dry Tortugas. <laughs> There are two ways to get to the Tortugas. This is one of them. The only alternative is aircraft. There's a seaplane service. But remember, we're going to the dry Tortugas, devoid not only of water, but shelter as well. The Tortugas traveler, then, must provide for his own provisions and accommodations. So if you go by plane, be prepared to pack your food and pitch a tent. Then, too, there's something about going by boat that seems to enhance the experience. The Tortugas is 179 nautical miles south of Egmont Key. Averaging six knots, the trip takes about 36 hours. An offshore ocean passage that not only heightens our anticipation, but adds to our appreciation of this remote, remarkable, and perhaps the most formidable of any American landfall. A day in the life of the nautical news crew, and as it comes to an end, our thoughts turn to dreams of dropping anchor, and tomorrow's landfall, a fortress that rises from the sea. They call our destination the Dry Tortugas, but getting there wasn't. With the dawn of our second day came a persistent drizzle. But if the weather was to worsen, we weren't worried. We had raised the light at Loggerhead Key, signifying safety from any storm-tossed sea. For we would soon be within the circle of seven reefs that provides a sanctuary to sailors, assuming we threaded our way through safely. But between bearings on the light and buoys to steer by, we had it a lot easier than mariners of days gone by. When he discovered the islands in the year 1513, Ponce de Leon found no aids to navigation just a tropical atoll populated by turtles, hence the name Tortugas. In the centuries that followed, the Tortugas would be a frequent stopping place for members of the British and Spanish fleets, not to mention many notorious pirates. But leaving Loggerhead astern, our attention turned to our main objective, the fortress on Garden Key, the place they call the Gibraltar of the Gulf. The U.S. government recognized the strategic importance of the Tortugas early on. Any nation occupying the islands would control navigation of the Gulf. And so in 1846, the War Department began construction. And Fort Jefferson's eight-foot thick walls rose over 50 feet above the reef. Sixteen million bricks are contained within its one-half-mile circumference. Fortified with 450 guns, it would be garrisoned by 1,500 men. But with miserable working conditions, it was almost impossible to get volunteers to build the fort. 
As a result, most of the construction was completed by slaves. Thirty years of back-breaking work went by, but before the fortress was completed, it proved to be obsolete. The rifled cannon had been invented, a weapon that could reduce Fort Jefferson's massive walls to dust in a matter of days. In the ten years following the Civil War, the fort served as a prison. And ironically, it was in this capacity that Fort Jefferson achieved its greatest claim to fame. Regrettably, through a terrible miscarriage of justice. This Gibraltar rising from the Gulf is today our nation's most inaccessible national park. But at the time of the Civil War, it served as a prison, and it was an obscure family physician from Maryland who caused Fort Jefferson to find its place in history. It's 1865, and at the Ford Theater tonight, there's a special guest, the President of the United States. Also attending the performance is a man named John Wilkes Booth. In his escape, the assassin jumped to the stage, breaking a leg. Knowing nothing of the assassination, it would be Dr. Mudd's misfortune to be the physician who had set it. A humanitarian act that was to convict him as a conspirator and send him to Fort Jefferson to serve a life sentence. Dr. Mudd would serve four years in the torrid hell of the Tortugas. Ironically, it was the outbreak of an epidemic that ultimately would free him. Spread by mosquitoes, yellow fever ran rampant among the ranks. But Dr. Mudd emerged from his cell to save many of the garrison's company. In gratitude, both prisoners and soldiers successfully petitioned President Andrew Johnson to pardon him. But it wasn't until President Carter took office that Dr. Mudd was fully exonerated for any part in the assassination. More than a century has passed since Dr. Mudd looked to the shark-filled moat from his cell. And over the years, the evidence of deterioration is not hard to find. Lime stalagmites formed by eroding mortar from which the construction gets its strength are present throughout the long corridors. Originally, it was believed the fort had been built on a strong coral foundation, but tests completed in the late 1800s proved otherwise. The foundation instead was a combination of sand and coral, and soon Fort Jefferson began settling. Cracks can be seen where the fort is slowly collapsing under its own massive weight. 